Welcome to the Virtual Foundry Podcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Virtual Foundry Podcast. This is Volume 3, Episode 6. Today is Friday, June 3rd, 2022. The time is 10.59 a.m. here in southern Wisconsin, and the temperature is an absolutely lovely 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 21 degrees for you Celsius users. The sun is shining. It's an absolutely perfect day. And we've got about 10 more of these in our future. So we are being rewarded with some beautiful temperatures for a long stretch here. I plan to relish every minute of it. In today's podcast, we're gonna do a part two of partner innovator frequently asked questions. I'm Trisha Cease, president of the Virtual Foundry. And with me as always is Brad Woods, our founder, inventor, all around science guy. Say hello, Brad. Hi, everybody. So, you know, Brad, I mentioned the beautiful weather that we're having, and I know you appreciate that. You walk to work most days. Yep. Um, and now we, as we're headed into summer here in Southern Wisconsin, that means hot, humid days. And that brought the question from John, one of our partner innovators, how should I store my filament for the summer humidity? How can we prepare for that? Right. <clears throat> and I put a lot of thought into the best way to answer this. And the easiest way to think about it is to treat it like you do your other PLA. Um, the long answer, however, is that filament is actually more resilient than PLA uh, for a number of reasons. It will take up less water. Uh, it's less hygroscopic than normal PLA uh, and also very little of the filament is actually plastic. So it's a very small amount of plastic and a whole lot of metal. The metal obviously doesn't take up any, any uh, doesn't take up any water, just the plastic does. Um, and we've run long-term experiments where, like you can see behind me, I have a, a pile of spools that just, they sit out. We don't give any special accommodations to them. We leave them out while we're working on it. And I even have samples that I leave out for long periods of time just to see if they're going to change. And so far, they do not. The thing that we were in a room that's pretty well climate controlled, um, it doesn't get above, say, 75, and it doesn't get below, say, 65. Um, but it can be quite humid. So like currently the relative humidity in here is 55 and I'm trying to get that down a little bit, but, but that's, you know, that's reasonably humid and not abnormal for summer. Um, if you were outside, you know, it could shoot up as high as say 65 or 70 or right before it rains, obviously just about hundred, but, um, but yeah, like I said, we've set, had the stuff sitting out for long periods of time and it doesn't seem to be an issue where that gets a little bit trickier is people that live in tropical climates and and this comes up so like we had uh, a user that had their lab in the attic of their house in new orleans so you know it was sort of the ultimate outlier um and he did have some problems that were probably related to moisture uptake over time. So within a climate controlled environment, the other thing that we wanna watch out for is no direct heat source, no direct sunlight, things like that. Right. Um, I asked you the question earlier, will an air conditioner blowing on it bother it? And the answer is not. Yeah, that part will be fine, but we do wanna watch out for applied heat. So uh, a heat vent, direct sunlight in a window, things like that. So within a normal climate controlled environment, um, your material is gonna be absolutely fine. You don't need to do any special storage uh, for your filament on the shelf. Yep, and one thing I wanna warn people off of is we've had a few people that will take their whole spool and literally put it in an oven expecting to dry the material and this is a bad idea uh, the material become it causes the polymers to degrade very quickly and you'll wind up with incredibly brittle brittle unusable filament yeah we have that fill warmer device which serves the same purpose but it's only heating up that one strand of filament 
as it goes through the warmer. And that is to toughen up the material and ease the path from the spool to the printer. So when you, but the effect lasts for about 24 hours. So when you bake the whole spool at once, you're essentially using a giant fill of warmer on the whole thing at once. The effect will, it will work, but the effect will go away after a day. And then all of your filament will be extremely brittle. Yes, there's an exception here. There are some commercial filament dryers that work more like um, uh, food dehydrators or something like that. And they tend to run at, you know, maybe 80 or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. That, it can tolerate that. That's not so bad. But again, it's not necessary to dry the material. Okay, great. Thank you for that explanation. Oh, one thing that we should mention that if you are in an environment like that, or if you want to, if you're in an extra human environment um, and you want to sort of try to help out your filament, you can put that in a plastic bag with some desiccant inside and, and store it like that. Right, it'll never hurt to keep it dry. Now, Brad, around here in the Virtual Foundry, there are always improvements being made to every part of the process, and that includes how the filament is actually made, our manufacturing process in-house here. And the latest improvements that have been made to the manufacturing process have resulted in material that's more flexible than ever. And that has come with a surprise consequence. So talk us through that a little bit. All right. So it's, it's been a quest over time to increase the, the metal content and create a material that has the least amount of plastic possible. And early on, um, our early versions were, were brittle. They're difficult to handle, not very flexible. Um, so we've been improving our manufacturing process. We've been improving our blend of polymers. And we've gotten to a point where it's actually so flexible that we've gotten to some unintended consequence. So this material, you can break it, but you can also twist it around your finger and, it, and it's, it's quite flexible. And what's happening is you wind up with some of the challenges that you might run into with TPU. Um, and an apt analogy would be trying to shove a spaghetti noodle through a straw. Mm. It, just, it just doesn't want to go, it wants to buckle and it wants to clog the tube. And it's also a bit softer. <clears throat> so if you're using excessive retraction, the, the pinion gears that drive it forward, they'll move over, back and forth over the same spot, you know, sometimes a dozen times. And this will slowly crush the material and it will lead to what presents itself as a, as a clog. Now retraction is a setting in your slicer program um, so if you go into your slicer, whatever slicer you're using, it's just going to be called retraction. And what should that setting be to work with this more flexible filament material? Um, there are two different aspects to the retraction. One is how far it retracts and two is how frequently. And both of them have an effect here. So what we've been using on our printers in house here uh, is a retraction of about one millimeter on the high end, maybe one and a half millimeters. But the other part of it is to set it so that it doesn't retract incessantly. So you can get into a situation if you're printing something very small where it will retract dozens of times in a minute. And this has the effect of wearing down the filament, crushing it and uh, making it so that it can no longer move forward. So it's a question or it's a matter of both minimizing the distance that you retract it and the frequency with which you retract it. Okay, we do have time for another partner innovator question today. And we see this, we love it when people write us in for help with their process. And it's even better when they send pictures. It helps us quickly diagnose what's happening. And sometimes we'll see parts that are kind of black and crumbly. They've gone through that debine and center cycle, but they just didn't turn out right. Uh, what's happening when your final part is black and kind of crumbly? It falls apart a little bit. Oxidation. It's um, the same thing every time we get this complaint and it's a failure to mitigate the oxygen that's present. 
So working with the uh, copper and bronze, for example, <clears throat> there's nothing about copper that's black, but cupric oxide is jet black. So if it's black, you know you had oxide present at the same time that you had temperatures that were very high. And this is typically mitigated by, you know, it's buried in the ballast or in the, uh, or in the carbon. It's the carbon that sacrifices itself to get rid of the oxygen that's present. So the most common cause of this is either not using enough carbon or creating a situation where enough oxygen is getting to the carbon that it burns off. And this is oxygen not from inside of your crucible, but oxygen from outside of your kiln that's getting in. And the best way we've come up with to sort of conserve the amount of carbon that you need to use or gets consumed and make sure that you have enough present during the sintering cycle is to cover the crucible, whether it's with kiln paper or even a, like a chunk of fire brick. It doesn't have to be fancy. Uh, it can be tool wrap. You only want it covered so that the air can't blow across it. You don't want it sealed so that nothing can get out because there are still gases that need to escape during the sintering process. Okay, great. So we see a black and crumbly part. We know that oxygen is the culprit. So in the next trial, take some extra steps to minimize the amount of oxygen um, that reaches or eliminate the amount of oxygen that reaches the part by using lots of sintering carbon on top. And then also minimize the amount of oxygen that the sintering carbon has to deal with by covering your crucible um, lightly, not in a sealed way. Right, and the other benefit here is you can reuse the carbon indefinitely this way. You'll know if you can't, you'll know if the carbon has been consumed because it will be ash. You, there is no gray area. If it's black and looks like the sintering carbon you started with, it's good to use again. And that also means that it did its job. If you've got a, lay, a good layer of like new sintering carbon left at the end, your parts look great. I do have one more very important question for you, Brad. All right. Why did the invisible man turn down the job offer? I can't imagine. He just couldn't see himself doing it. Uh, nice. Hey, if you're working with filament and you need a little guidance, check out the website, check out the YouTube, reach out to us at info at the virtual foundry.com. It's important that you're successful and we're here to help you with that. If you have a project you're working on and you want to showcase in this format, if you have a question or an issue or a topic that you'd like to see us do a deep dive in one of these podcasts, reach out to me at info at the virtual foundry.com. We would love to do a podcast episode with or for you. In the meantime, happy printing, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Um. Hang on. That's like fingernails on a chalkboard. <laughs> All set? Yep. Let her rip. Oh, wait.